Good evening. Welcome again to Reloved Guitars. And here we have, well, the first right-handed guitar in a while. Through, actually, it's not the, <laughs> the most. Uh, I've had a couple, but it's been a lot of lefties recently. But here we have a Fender Duo Sonic. Um, this is a nice little, um, made in Mexico, jobby um, humbucker, single coil, three-way switch, very simple design. Um, we have a rosewood neck with an older body and a sort of um, Pelham blue, one of the, uh, maybe it's Lake, Lake Placid, I don't know, one of those nice nice blue and a mint green scratch plate with lovely Fender Tuna jobbies on the top. Um, James sent me this, he got it recently um, and he was his first impression was he was disappointed by the sharpness of the fret ends. Oh, I better get a close-up. We'll do that while we're at it. Yeah, I'll carry on trying to talk. If I can get it to video. Yeah, let's get to video. Okay, ready for the video close-up. We get it running and we get a sound. Both cameras can... No, actually, it's just for me to sync on to. Anyway, so yeah, here we have the um, Duo Sonic and it's a, a nice little offset guitar. Um, mint green scratch plate, a couple of screw on, uh, screw attached, whoops, screw attached knobs with cellophane attached under, which we'll get rid of. Um, hardtail bridge, humbucker in the bridge position, single coil in the neck, three way toggle, and um, jumbo looking frets. Uh, it's a short scale, it's, um, uh, what the hell is it, 24 inches. And we've got um, the nice sort of stratty vintage style headstock. And there's a, what well, looks like a tusk nut in there. It's very nicely fitted, which I'm pleased to say is a good trait of the Fender. And we have the tuners, Fender stamp tuners. And we've got some cellophane caught on the back plate here, which I'd like to take off as well, because it's horrible. And then we've got the, uh, the string through, the string attachments there. So this came to me. Um, for a setup. Um, James wants uh, a low light setup. He's, he says his way of describing it, he's, a, he's more of a lead player than a rhythm player. So he wants the, he wants to be able to bend and you know, move around quickly. So I played this last night and I really liked it. I liked how straightforward it was. Um, I actually also quite enjoyed it having a high action to a degree in that, um, you know, it sort of felt quite old fashioned, but I'm going to, it's, it's quite high at the moment. I'm going to um, reduce it a bit. We're going to check it for uneven frets. Um, and if we need to, we'll fret level it to make it better. Um, let's stop with the close ups right now. Oh, I shouldn't have stopped that, but never mind, because <laughs> I was going to show. I have here prepared earlier off camera an adjustable nut. Um, tusk adjustable nut, one of my little custom jobbies, and I'm going to fit this so that it's exactly the same pitch and everything as the other one, and we get an adjustable um, nut for perfect tuning without any worries about the strings sticking in hand cut slots or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, so initial thing is to we'll, we'll set, we'll go for a, a setup, remove the plastics, everything else works. I tested it out. Um, there's even plastic, oh, that's, yeah, a little bit caught in there, we'll get rid of that. Um, change the nut, get the setup how we want it, nice and low, um, and then if it needs it, fret level, um, and then crown and polish out. I did a bit of a, a, bit of a check here um, beforehand as well, get some measurements done. Um, the, the first fret action on here is high, it's uh, on the first, uh, sorry, on the high E, it's a point is 0.5 on the B it's 0.55 on the G it's 0.5 and then D A and E is 45 uh, 0.45 which isn't too bad um, but you know it's inconsistent and it's it's a sort of pretty good stab at a nut it's not that far out that it would make it difficult to play um, but it's not it's not it's not ideal and that's what the the uh, tusk nut is going to give us the the opportunity to get that sort of standardised across the um, across the game uh, assuming of course that these are these machine cut slots are uh, relatively speaking good and that they usually are that's that's what I found with these it's very rare I think it's about one in 20 you get one slot that isn't as cut to the same you know um, radius as the others okay so we're gonna we're gonna do that the yeah the first right action was a little bit high 
The last fret on the high E is 1.6, which is higher than it needs to be. The low E was, um, last fret action was two. And again, that can be half a fret less than that. And the relief is quite big as well. It was 0.5 and, and we can reduce that by, you know, at least half, if not a bit more. And that changes quite significantly the way the guitar um, feels. Just gonna cut off for a minute, I have to do something and I'll be back. Okay, so back again, let's get on with this duo sonic. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to double check the relief and um, I'm going to take it down a little bit. People say, people say to me, what amount, how, what amount, how much amount of relief do I need? Um, and the answer is, it's, it's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Subjective. Um, it's as much or as little as you personally like. Now, the point is, your strings need some, I'm going to have a longer one of these, your strings need some uh, relief, some amount of curvature to allow the strings to move. You can play a guitar with the neck completely straight. Blimey, this is a long way down. Not easy, not easy to access. I should somewhere. I should have a longer thing. Uh, this one is about the longest one I've got. I better keep this out actually. I don't know how well you can see this, but um, now this is uh, this is a Mexico, isn't it? Oh yes. So that might actually that might actually require a different one. I've got a Mexico one here. Let's put out specially. That one there. It's difficult. The hex keys I find always difficult. It's difficult to feel what you're grabbing onto. There we go. That's pretty stiff, but it's working. Made in Mexico hex key. It's an imperial one, so that's why I've got that standing by. Okay, that's good. Let's cut that down to about two. So, we'll have, 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 have another look at the uh, relief, and we'll, we'll stick a, one of those thingies in it. Yeah, so the, the, the short scale, um, 24 inch, 24 inch um, scale length, what are we looking at? That's too big. You want a 20 at the start of the door, 25. 25 to 25. Yes, the short scale is a, is a different beast to your other guitars. That's more, we'll come down a bit more. Think about, um, just going back to the relief for a minute. Think about the relief is, the relief has an amazing impact on the way a guitar feels. And a lot of people, it's amazing how, how a lot of people are very afraid of uh, using the tr adjusting the truss rod and this is very stiff this one actually I have to say um, blimey. yeah they're afraid of adjusting it and I think you know there's a lot of t a lot of times you get these sort of horror stories of or people fear that adjusting the truss rod will cause breakage or damage um, and it's it's very 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 difficult to break a truss rod unless it's already broken or it's waiting to sort of um, you know, seize up or snap or whatever, shear off. Um, you know, in which case, if it's rusted through some some something like that, it's been exposed to a lot of water or something. You, you, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, well that's that's down to about one point point one five two at the most, which is much lower. That's right in the way I hit it all the time. Now, last night playing this, I didn't get any chokes because the action was fairly high. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my adjuster. Now these will be the metric ones, which is strange. So they've got, no, they're not. That's good. I was going to say, if it was a cross of metric and US, it would be really odd, uh, metric and imperial. 
So you have to have the right watts it. So I'm going to go for, I'll come back to the business of relief in a minute. Um, right, we are on, now we're down to one point, one point, just under one point three or four, something like that, like a very tiny, a minor tiny adjustment. And then this is quite a bit higher, so it can come down. Yeah, so the, the issue of um, truss rods, people can be, a lot of people can be very nervous about adjusting them. And like I say, it's very rare that you can break them. You have to work very hard to break one. In fact, I've, I've deliberately tried to break some in the past in old necks that um, I no longer use or need. And it, I found it nigh on impossible to break them. Okay, it's a bit better now. Yeah, very difficult to break them. So, so the, all the sort of stories about um, you know the, don't don't crank your truss rod because you could do some damage. Very very unlikely that you will. Um, so, my first recommendation with the truss rod is always to people to get get on and try it out. Don't take somebody else's word for what's a good setting. Um, you know, make sure you try it out for yourself. G you know, given the, the fact that you really will find it difficult to break it. Um, so the answer to the question, what's the right amount of relief? Basically, the guitar will play from no amount of relief up to a millimeter of relief. Um, the problem is, when you get up to a millimeter of relief, it's um, it, the action around the middle of the guitar, particularly around here, will feel enormous. It'll feel like the action is very high, um, but it's highest here. But it just it doesn't feel like a very nice guitar to play. And this is all beautifully out of tune now. Um, so my my recommendation recommendation would be if you if you want to find out what works for you. Well, my recommendation is adjust your um, your truss rod full stop. On the basis, it's really important that you learn what it does, and more than anything, you learn what the extremes of settings do, because then you'll know what what works for you and what you don't want. So, even if it comes to you and you like it, I would suggest you get hold of it and um, set it to its extreme. Set it to its extremes and just spend some time playing it so you know what it's like when it's almost flat as a, um, the desert or whether, you know, when it's really curved. And see how big a difference a small adjustment makes. Because there are times when I can set up a guitar and think it's kind of nice and then I, I go back and I flatten the neck out a tiny bit more and it just it feels like a whole new guitar, a whole different guitar. So in terms of feel, probably, um, the, it's the, the adjustments you can make, for example, changing the first fret action at the nut can make a huge difference to how tiring the guitar does or doesn't feel to play. So if it's 0.5 and over, it can feel quite difficult. You're pressing down and it's, it's a, a lot of effort. If you take that down to a 0.3, which is about as low as I like to go, um, then it suddenly becomes effortless. Similarly, a small adjustment in the relief can make the whole guitar feel like a much lower action than it really is. Um, and probably last, Last of all um, is the adjustment of the last fret action, as I call it, or the saddles at the bridge, which, which um, have less of an overall feel impact to me. Um, you can go up and down quite a lot before it really changes the feel. That's my personal subjective take on it, and obviously that is subjective. That's an important bit to remember. And I'm just double checking where all these stand right now. That's a little bit high. Um, and we'll get this. Roughly where I likes it. That's about where it is right now.
So here I have the guitar set at a lower action. Um, we, we still have the same nut in it, which we're going to change. Um, I'm, I'm going to do that now, um, and we'll reset the nut again. But I just wanted to, we can use this nut as it is, just to test things out. So. This is good, not, not bad at all. There's a couple down in the, in the G. Couple of very very tiny little zzz, and we're just about choking as we go right across onto the high on the high E bends at the top. But this is very very good. So please do a, you know report that's a good set of frets. I'm going to go ahead and level it anyway. That's what um, what James wanted me to do. Um, it, it's it, I'll do it because there is that tiny little bit of um, unevenness somewhere just around this this the G string at the top here. Um, and also because I want to soften the ends up and it helps uh, while, I'm, while I'm polishing out the frets after a, a very precision level, it, it allows me to um, take care of the fret ends as well, which I'll use a combination of files just to round them off a little bit um, and sandpaper just to get them, take the bite out of them. So this is on the edge of not needing um, fret leveling if you were happy to play it a little bit higher, but James specifically wanted an improvement on the action, so we'll go for that and we'll we'll make it play again. The relief in there, 0.2-ish, it's not the lowest, it's not the flattest in the world. You can often see um, relief when you look down at the curvature when you look down the neck, um, and it, it looks pretty even and a nice curve down there. So the next bit I'm going to do, before we go any further, is I'm going to get onto the um, the nut. Now this is a, this is a, a challenging a bit here. We're going to just slack the strings off because we want to use want to carry on using them as sacrificial strings. We're going to restring with nines. I think these are already nines. Um, just looking down here, the the, the string trees on these um, are pushed right down against the fingerboard because I guess because they don't want to leave them sort of sticking up. So they screw them right the way in, and it puts a really a, a major angle on the string. It's not really necessary to be that big. Um, I would, hey, if I had a spare one, I would I would use a tusk string tree on this. It would be much better for, for the tuning stability. I don't actually have a spare one kicking around. Um, unless I've got one on here. Let me just, oh no, that's not even, no. The answer is I don't. I thought I might have one on one of my guitars. No. So, um, if I can find a little, there's a little standy thing that you can, a little metal barrel you can stand the butterfly clip on to just raise it up. It looks a bit tidier. And I have one somewhere, and actually I've got a set here in something that says, uh, it says string trees, but I can't remember what box it went into now. Oh, lordy. Crimps, no, use pots, no, nuts. There's four nuts, there's more of them. Oh, what happened in here? Huh? Oh yeah, that's okay. Uh, string trees, string trees. We had, sorry about this, we had uh, spring through ferrules. Oh my lordy, we had tusk string trees. We got regular ones in there. No, but we've got a little fender one, but that requires a slight modification, which I'm not gonna do unless somebody was happy with that. So somewhere, I got string trees. Uh, here's some cheap string trees. Now, that's what I was looking for, a little handful of Chinese string trees. Uh, but the reason I was happy to find these is because there is, in each set, these are, uh, I never use these, so 
this is kind of no use to me. This has got the two little metal watsits. So what I can do is find the right thing. Uh, take up this. Take up this one here, and we'll we'll put down a little metal barrel underneath just to lift. I don't think it needs to be that extreme of an angle, as they like to say in certain countries. Now you need enough for this little thingy to pull into, but I would say this will be this little brass brass a little chrome thing will be enough to both hold it and lift it off the deck so the angle just so the angle isn't quite so extreme can we get it to fit on that would be good okay so we can go down to um yeah just above the it sits above now which is not as extreme that's what i like right anyway the whole point was to undo these and take off take off the um the nut. Now getting a, a nut and removing it from a guitar like this is uh, not the easiest thing in the world because it's um, it's they're, they're nicely fitted on this. Um, sometimes, if the if the action was dead right, I wouldn't. I, and this is a, a synthetic nut material anyway. If the action was right on this one, I wouldn't uh, change it out. You know, I take the sort of it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it approach. But in this case, um, the, the the height is isn't right, and we'd have to uh, cut it with the files anyway to get it get it correct, get it right. So, and I'm more and more reluctant to um, to cut into the um, uh, cut into the slot. So I think the, the the beauty of a, a new nut is not cutting the slots yourself. They're not, regardless of which files you use, you, you always leave kind of scratching and rough surface. So if we're going for the, the kind of full effect of buying tusk, which is ready lubricated, but also, as I say, has the factory slots pre-cut, then we might as well use it to its full extent, which is um, don't touch the slots. And the beauty of the adjustable one is we can bring it up to the correct height um, and we don't have to make uh, do anything to the slots. So looking at this one, actually it's not it's not partly finished over, it's just very snugly fit, uh, fitted. Um, so that is, it has a little bit of finish over this side. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my other glasses and just <coughs> very carefully score along the edge of this. It's um it's very difficult to, to do without um the light's pretty good I should say these great big white LEDs. So yeah it's it's quite difficult to do so you have to be brave basically and it helps if you're if you're comfortable wielding a a blade freehand and controlling it so yeah see I'm using my thumb to make it do what I want so that's scored it on that end and then we'll score it this end it is beautifully fitted that's no doubt about it it's kind of the best of the factory machines I have to say you can hear the rain a falling here in West Devon. Of course, you have to be careful because as you wield the um, craft knife, it's very easy to cut yourself in the process. So on the other side, um, you just have to be conscious of what you've got down here depends how they, they finish. Sometimes they'll do the finish and then put the nut in after that. And um, other times, let's take a new, get a new blade on this. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they'll finish right up to the nut, like in a, in a carpet 
or a buttress if you like and that can um, that can lead to quite a bit of cracking as the as you score down there um, because it's quite a thick layer and this one isn't like that it's, it's quite a, a neat connection so I'm just I'm just kind of carefully running the blade down the very corner of the nut you'll have a bit of stuff coming up obviously it's cutting a little bit of the finish or whatever went up against the nut itself you can see a little, little it's like dragonfly wings coming up and then once you've got that finish seal broken you can then just carefully go down a bit steeper down the gap just to make sure you you've got a, a head start on it keeping your other fingers out the way so you don't get yourself sliced in the process. Now I'm not entirely confident this is going to come off, it's flying out so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little dent in it actually I'm going to drill a little drill is that what I'm going to do? Yeah I'll drill a little impression in it um, I might even do it by hand maybe I'll do it with a drill um, just so I can have a, a place to grip if I want to tap it and drive it, because at the moment I've got no purchase. So I'm going to remove it, that's final. Um, so get my smallest drill bit. And then get it all supported and still. And I'm going to go into the end. It's actually quite a blunt drill, <laughs> believe it or not. But it's created a, a little little dimple for me to bite onto. I might get another one from on the drill press I've just used for doing the um, adjustable nut. So this is a very delicate sort of part of the process. Um, sometimes this is a, like I say, it's it's sort of half and half whether I would put a, a want to put an adjustable on here. They, they I think they improve things all round, but. Um, there are times when you wouldn't, when it's obvious to put one on. Where the nut needs some improvement. This one's pretty good, only, you know, I'm doing it for sort of perfectionism because I don't want to cut into the nut slots. Okay, so now we've got a little dimple in there and I could do with a thing to drift it out, which I don't actually have drift, can you believe it? So I need something I can use as a, a drift. I've probably got some in here, hidden away. Um, I've got a metal punch, that might just be, that might be useful. Some of that. Yeah, a little bite there. Then we can attack gently. Yep, yeah, that's good, it's coming out. Very, very, very gentle. I want this out, but I don't want it to break off any of the um, rosewood underneath or anything like that. So there you go. That's a, a nice, very safe um, little removal. Jolly good. Well, that's now that's taken me by a slight surprise because it's a, a curved um, slot which isn't the end of the world because the, the adjustable nut works perfectly well on a curved slot as well. Um, but what we might want to do before we use it is we might want to replicate the curve or the copy, duplicate the curve um, on the nut just to, since while we're at it, just to keep it the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out the little um, grub screws, which are tiny, and I'm going to map the curve 
onto the bottom of this one and then I'm going to hand file it at some in some moment. Um, let's do it this way. We'll put a bit of tape on it. And move that, move that, move that. Get me my cutting board, which is always handy to have nearby. So first of all, cut me the shape at the bottom of there. Then we can which way are we going? That way, this, uh, that way, and that way. Just to be on the safe side. Okay. It's quite hard to hold two things like this together. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put these together like that. And with a bit of luck and care, I'm going to do that. Let's see what we've got. Uh, hard to see but we've actually got the radius there and if I want to which I definitely do I can draw on it and mark it up hopefully it won't wick the ink underneath this green stuff and I'll press it down really flat in the hope that it doesn't don't go under there please please okay and that if you're ever wanting to copy the radius the underside radius or something is probably a good way to do it. And it's wicked under there. That's useless. It, it still shows me, I can see what it is. Um, but it's, why is that, you can never get a tape that doesn't, doesn't let the ink go underneath it. Anyway, I can, I can see the, I can see where I'm going. <laughs> right, so that is my guide mark. I mean, you know, it's a, if we didn't, Actually, this, you know what? I'm not sure this is a tusk. Is it a tusk? I didn't see in the specs what exactly what this is. It, this could be, it looks a bit more plastic to me. Uh, the cut, it's filed at the top. I mean, it's not bad looking at all. We, you know, if we, if we wanted to have the adjustability, um, for example, with this, uh, and we didn't want to cut that, we could actually drill this and make this adjustable as well. So we've got the options to do that. But let's carry on with this one. I'll put that to one side. So I'm going to, um, basically, I'll get myself a little Dremel thing. I don't know how well you'll see this, but I'll do it by hand over here somewhere. And I'll Dremel it. Am I plugged in? Yes. Dremel. And see if I can just work it to where I want it by hand. Right, so I'll put the Dremel in the vice section and do that way. Bring the workpiece, bring the workpiece to the Dremel. So forgive the lack of sound. Ah! There it is, that important thing. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be, what's the word, 
Let me hand carved. It's gonna. I mean, this in a way, this is just kind of to make it fit a little bit better in the slot. But it, it's going to stand on its feet anyway, so it doesn't have to map the uh, the curvature exactly. Right. And what we'll also do with this is I'm going to um, just slightly um, sand off the what do you call them? These things, grub screws, just so they're flat on the end. I think they are. Uh, actually, some of them are flat, some of them are slightly cone point. But we'll make sure they're all flat on the end. Difficult to stand it up. This is normally um, normally not. You don't have to do this bit for replacing it because it's normally well, most of the time it's a flat slot. Um, they do make tusk nut with the curved underside, but I didn't get that one. I'm not sure if I've got one anywhere in my collection either. I think I might have used one just the other day on something else. So, well in the gap without any squeezing I don't want to have to push it in or they will have to push it into the, into the hole I've got a, a sanding board but I'm kind of using this as a temporary measure um, if you're going to slightly thin down a nut recommend doing it on its flat side or its largest surface area side so that you can keep it nice and um, flat to the block. Almost there. I'm not going to go to this, tempting though it is, I'm not going to go to the back side because that's a thinner side and it's actually much easier to go off track and lose the squareness of the nut. So I'm just kind of helping it stay flat with a bit of extra surface pressure. What you you want to do is take the is adjust the nut to the slot. It's much harder, um, much harder to work to redo the slot on here. You don't want to be trying to widen the slot. You can you know you can throw the nut away and start again if you have to. Um, but but you, you really can't do the same with the You've got a big problem if you mess up the slot. Much bigger problem. So when you're, whenever you're sanding, is, is keep an eye, a close eye on the perpendicularity, if you like, of the the bit you're working on. Now, actually, what's going to happen is we may actually get to a point where I didn't really need to. Um, take down the uh, curve that because we may actually need to um, we may need to um, take some more 
this may be too tall for the beginning, we need to get it down so that the, the strings sit before we, before we dial in the grub screws, the strings want to sit on the first fret. And this may actually be too tall, so it may be better that we, um, I don't know if I can show it, it may be better if we go, just um, flatten it off and take it down a bit, in which case it won't be, it'll just be flat again, but it'll be flat over a curve, but the, the grub screws will take up the distance, if you, if you get what I mean. Um, they'll do, they'll do the, play the part of the, these end pieces, touching the, what you call it? <laughs> I know what I mean. Touching the uh, rosewood. So I'm just taking my time to get this down into the right sort of thickness for this slot, because I want it to sit in the slot, but I also want it to be able to move up and down. So I, I really don't want it too loose, but I, obviously it can't be jammed in there. So. We're just looking for very light sanding. You know, we can always take a bit more off on that principle, um, but we can't put it back on. So any minute there, we'll get to uh, a fit that we can work with, and we'll see how much we need to take off the bottom. If, if, like I say, if I have to take it off the bottom to get the height right, then then you can forget the stage where I went to try and make the curve because it wasn't really necessary. But I kind of. I often like to copy things just for the sake of it. Um, if it was sitting on the on the actual wood itself and we were gluing it to the wood, then I'd want the curve on the bottom of the nut because we want it to sit firmly on the wood across the whole of the slot. We're nearly there on thickness. Um, the other thing is I've, I've tried making these adjustable nuts in the past with bone and bone for some reason well not for some reason bone is, is a little bit too brittle <laughs> to do this tusk can you can you can tap a drill and tap a thread through the through the hole there you go that's just sitting in there now um, yeah you can you can drill and tap with um, with um, tusk but you can't do it with bone some reason okay so first of all now that's that's going to be too tall and we can we can test it um, by unhooking the uh, oh, I folded it on the inside didn't I that was clever of me we can unhook the green paper if we can't unhook it then we can just cut it keep it simple uh, Okay, so we'll just put that in there for a minute and we'll just tighten it up. We'll just see where it sits to begin with. And it's, uh, it's yeah, it's under, under tension and it's too tall. So we want to take it down and we can take it all down from underneath. Uh, we'll just lift it out there. Now for this I will get the larger sanding board. sanding all kinds of things so it's quite well used okay so with this now if I'm sanding downwards I want to keep a cross I want to keep it sort of flat on the bottom section and you just have to sort of keep checking and make sure you're taking it down at the same sort of rate um, and keeping that nice square section Bottom, if you're going to sand it down, the bottom wants to be perpendicular to the front edge of the nut, obviously. Um, it takes a bit of practice and constant checking, uh, and eventually you'll get to a place where um, you can put it back in the slot. Now, what I know about this is that it's going to, on its own, it's going to rock because we haven't got the grub screws in and it's going to rock around the curve, but that's okay for a minute. Um, but again, we're, we're, we're checking to see where how much we've taken off, how much we need to go. So it's quite a bit. And this is going to be a, a thin nut by the time we get it to where we want, which is what I also quite like about it. Um, it takes most of the nut away, and you're left with a, a very fine nut that gets just lifted up enough to reach the ideal height. 
and then remains adjustable if you want to change it and increase it. But starting from the strings touching the first fret at, at its sort of resting place is a good place to begin because um, then you, you can always go up from that point. Quite difficult to grip on that in this stage, so you need to sort of get used to. I, as you see, I tend to hold the piece and move my whole body, so I'm, I'm, I know I'm making a, a flat square base on the bottom. Um, so, what will happen is once this sits in, it's going to sit nice and low, and I'm, I'm checking it out on the, the G time being just because it's there and it's in the middle and it won't cause the thing to rock too much so we're getting downwards and eventually um, we'll get down to a little bit more and we'll have the basic nut ready and then we'll put the grub screws in sand them off so that they are flat and they spread the weight and then we'll put them in and bring the screws up from there So always checking. Again, if you get it wrong, you wasted only a, a ten only a ten pound nut, which is much better than mess, messing up the slot or you know, anything else. So you can always just buy another one. So what we end up with is a very small object to do the job more finely crafted object. Take off the overhanging bits. You can very, very, uh, whoop, sits right low in the slot. Now the only, not really a downside, but if there is a downside with adjustable nuts is that once they're on, they can ping off um, if you take the one, if you start at one end and, and go the other way, uh, it'll, it, it, it tends to flip the nut off. That's almost there, so a little tiny bit more, and we'll be pretty much on the mark. It seems like a lot of hassle, um, but for the tuning stability it gives, I really, really like this touch. people say things like oh, I don't know about things things on um, you know, standing on two points you know won't that affect the sound and it it, it doesn't not uh, not in my experience of it okay we're almost there now we're down to I want it I want it touching as a as a start point I want I want the thing to touch the strings to touch and then we're we're upward onwards and upwards from there so I'm going to Concentrate on just squaring this off a little bit more, and then it will be done. Yes, lovely. I think that is pretty much it. Such a delicate little thing, really. Um, okay, let's get this paper off here. Sorry. Touching, yep, touching the thing. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to retrieve my grub screws and using this thing I'm going to very gently. Uh, often I do this by putting them back inside the nut and running the nut along the bottom um, or sticking them out and then um, letting the, going backwards and forwards with the nut and it's, a, it's not a bad way of doing it actually. Sometimes I have a dummy nut ready for that purpose, so I don't mind taking a bit of extra height off it. Um, okay, so here we go. Let's put that one down. We just poke it just through, and then we get the other one. Just poke that vaguely through. I've made them with three nut, uh, three grub screws on them in the past, and they work pretty well too. 
just gives it an extra supporting point but it seems to work pretty well with two okay so with the the um, grub screws pointing through I just sort of hold them there and walk them up and down until we're down to the bow or the bone or the tusk again because what I want is there you go a lovely flat surface I don't know how well you can see that absolutely flat and that will that will the pressure then on the wood underneath will be distributed so there we have our start point and a tiny little hex key which I've got to order some more of now let's move this back here and we'll lift up our and cover our string thank you um, oh what I'm going to do while the things off while the strings are off make hay while the sun shines is I'm now going to um, do this I won't do the fret ends until I've done the tiny bit of leveling it's going to be very de delicate leveling um, like I say it hardly needs any at all it's very uh, a very good set of frets comparatively but we'll we do that little tiny bit and then I'll do the fret ends and I'll use a combination of the file but also using some sandpaper going up the edge now that kind of looks scary to people because as you go up the edge it has to um, it obviously has to kind of touch the uh, the binding uh, the, not binding the finish um, and sometimes you, you get a little bit of finish lift um, you know sanded but you can polish that out pretty quickly anyway okay so let's start with the D and the G tightening up now I'm hoping I'm assuming and I didn't do a check on this I'm assuming that the radius on this is um, the same so we shouldn't have any bizarre surprises um, but sometimes the guitars just don't have the radius you expect Put that down there for a minute and we'll find out pretty quickly if it's not um, but this should lifting this up should just replicate the, um, the radius okay so there is as good as I have I could want strings sitting on the first fret that's what I wanted to begin with and now we get the little grub screws and we kind of walk this up a little bit on the treble side and we walk it up a little tiny bit on the bass side and lo and behold it gives us our action now sometimes people say oh but it leaves a little gap at the end where the you can see into the slot which is of course how it does because it's um it's lifting it up but I, I kind of think that's not a bad price to pay for tuning stability. Okay, so we have now a very low action at the nut and we can adjust it to whatever we want. So there you have it. That's uh, slightly non-standard because of the curved um, nut business. I, I suppose I could, could I make one that had a little drop bit? That, no, because then you couldn't set it down. No, you'll always get a, a little gap. That's just the way it is. Um, but I, don't, I think it's not a bad price to pay. Right, I've got to take a break a minute. I'm just going to wash my hands. Back with you in a second. So we are on to the fret leveling, and here we go. And a few things now. Fret leveling tends to produce a bit of dust and grime, so I like to keep it off my new carpet if I can. Uh, it feels odd to be doing fret leveling on a right-handed guitar for first first time in a while. I need one of these. So, short scale fret leveling as well. Pardon me. Somebody asked me on a video, 
why are you using why are you using the Stumac uh, U-channel truss rod for your fret um, leveling? But I didn't really have a good answer, other than the mood struck me that way. Um, that was all there was to it, really. Uh, they, they they have sort of slightly different qualities. These different truss rods. Um, and sometimes one appeals to me and another one doesn't, sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the Stu, Stu Mac U channel one is a wider one and it's a bit stiffer when it's in, you know, when you've got the, the curve dialed in. And it's neither better or worse. This one's thinner um, and a little bit more flexible. And sometimes I just feel like the Stu Mac one is the one for me, and sometimes I don't. Anyway, um, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'll do an insert here on video, because I know that James is interested in this sort of stuff. Um, he was interested to know if there's going to be a video. And on the close-up, I should be able to, again, do a sort of visual cue at that point. <laughs> right, so when you've done the first sort of pass with the fret levelling, uh, tool. You can see here it's leveling, it's taking some off there, a little bit off there, not much off there, that's a low one relatively, those two are a little bit low. And then the rest of these are kind of in a very similar uh, height. We're talking tiny fractions of, of millimetre here, that one's a little bit low, that one's a you know, high-ish like the rest, a little bit low, um, and, it, and that one has got a little bit lower as you go in there and so on, and that one sticking up a little bit and that one's low so you can see it's taking the the with the configuration that or the calibration that I've um, made you can see it's cutting a little bit on all over the neck so it's telling me I've got the calibration right and what you're seeing is just the actual existing uneven frets and like I say they don't have to be they're not so bad that they make the guitar unplayable in this case um, but it just it it's very good to know if you're going to use this method at all you get um, the experience of reading what the uh, cut marks if you like are telling you now I'm, I'm going to just te check that it, all the notes play That one there is the only one at this action. And that's what's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yeah, that's 14, 15, 16, 17, 18th. So I'm going to do a tiny little bit more leveling on there just to see if I can clear that bit out. Now, what I'm going to do at this point, I'm just going to sort of, if anything, just vaguely press down a little bit up at this end, sort of, to, I would call it focusing the the truss rod. Um, we're, we're nowhere near to taking away loads of material. It's incredibly light touch, 400 grit paper, so you're hardly taking away anything. And that little tiny touch there has taken away that hint of a zzz that we heard. So that's how it works. Um, and to, to do this, I always recommend if people are going to learn to level this way, I always recommend um, trying a number of different truss rods until you find one that you're quite confident has the right adjustability for you because they all vary and, and find which one um, you feel safe and sound using. Now I can see straight away there's two low frets here. We spotted them when I said that they're starting to stay, they look low from that point onwards. So we've got two lower frets which a low fret makes the next one high, relatively speaking. But that's fine, those are below below the level of the chosen action, so not a problem at all. We don't have to keep on going until they're all um, ground down and you know ground equally or they've all had the black marker pen taken off. And actually that what, what that is what makes this method one of the things that makes this method quite a lot different from conventional fret leveling with the fret leveling file uh, which I showed before I've shown many times before that I, I started out on and you know it's perfectly good for what it what it is but um, 
and, and doing your frets this way is better than not doing them at all. But this this kind of fret file and you know checking with a rocker will kind of demand that you take or you, you, the convention is you, you keep going until you've got no more clicks on your rocker, but also you almost always uh, have to take material off all the frets, so you'll never have any left black like I do. Um, but because I, this method allows me only to level um, as much as is needed to make the chosen action play, and that's a very different proposition. So it, it preserves um, fret metal and it prevents unnecessary fret metal removal, which is one of the reasons why I, I like it. Now, I'm spending a little bit more time in what I call the G track at the moment because. The reason why is I know that these two frets are uneven, so I'm expecting maybe a little bit of buzz and I play in, or a little bit of zzz as I play in this area. Um, but also the G track is where bent E notes choke out. Not bad. So if I was having a choke out, right, that's choking out, and I would say. That's uh, choking out on the white mark, so that's between the G and the D track. Um, so I'm going to do a tiny bit, tiny bit more on the G track, and then I'll cross over to the D track. It may be, and it's quite possible, that for the chosen action here, um, the geometry of the radius, sounds like a big mouthful, the geometry of the radius eventually will defeat you bending uphill without getting chokes. Um, and that's why you, you literally cannot get an ultra low action on a vintage 7.25 uh, inch radius because um, I, I've shown this before, but it's always quite an interesting one to repeat. Um, let's see if I can just zip this across here. We should be charged. Okay, look at that. We can go live to action cam. So there's your settings, by the way, the Geosonic. There's my plan of action. I always like to do this plan of action. And here's my initial readings. Um, but what, what's interesting is if, if you think about if you think about your guitar long ways, right? Long ways. What you end up doing is you bend. You're bending the E across to there, and then it goes to the saddle over there, and it goes to the nut over there, and there's your big finger bending it across. And actually, what you know is it's it's kind of in what I call the G track by the time it gets there, you know, where the, where the G normally lives, right? So, as you bend it, the interesting thing is, if you think about it cross-section, uh, this is very exaggerated, right, your, your strings tend to live like this in these places, right? Whatever way you're looking at it, right? That's how your, your strings sit going down the curve, following the curve of the neck. Now, if, you, if you're bending um, <laughs> this is where I'm going to have to draw a really three-dimensional one any minute now. So just get, first of all, the first important thing to notice is when you, you bend this string, you press it down here onto there, and then you, you bend it, and you're bending it up a hill. And that's all you need to know right now is you're bending it up a hill, right? Yeah? Does that make sense? So hold that thought. So you're bending your string up a hill, usually the E. Let's take the E because it travels the furthest, farthest, furthest, farthest. Right? Now, let's do... Let's do a three-dimensional picture. Oh, oh my goodness. Let's try it. Uh -huh. And then, okay, there's, there's your neck frets stretching the length of the fingerboard. Let's draw a kind of line down there. It's three-dimensional. Woo! And you've got frets doing that. And they appear to get closer together, but that's down the nut end, right? Even, anyway, so remember we said we're starting with our E, which sits down here, and we're pushing it we're making a bend, remember? And it's coming down. It's going, but if you think about it, right, it's going, at this point, it's going uphill. Right, it makes a, a physical uphill movement. So it's describing a movement in, in, in the end plane. As I said before, it's kind of going up to there. The problem is, is that its end point is lower. Its end point is if you look in this height, straight on, end on, its end point its anchor point is down there and you're pushing it not only sideways but it's going sideways and up the hill but it's got to come back down to the end point which is the bridge and the problem is that is a downwards if you think about it as a straight line you're bending it up a hill and the string's got to come down again in physical height off the fin fingerboard and the problem is that the following frets are above that height 
and that you've run out of clearance. That's not a very good description actually, but I, I did a 3D drawing once that did work and I've forgotten what I said. But anyway, the point is, I'm just trying to get across that there comes a point, the tighter the radius you have, the, um, the more the bent string moves in a vertical plane. And the more it moves in a vertical plane as it's being bent, um, the higher it gets from its start points further up uh, at either end of the train. And the string has to go back downwards in a downward direction. So as it goes downwards to get to this end point, it's not only traveling sideways, you know, bent sideways, it's, it's bent up. So the string has to now come downwards and sideways to its anchor point of the saddle. And as it's coming downwards, it's just, it's clear, it's, it's snaffling up the, the clearance it would otherwise have if it was just going in a straight line at the same plane of height. Okay. That's the point I'm trying to make anyway. So that, that's the, the constraint of the geometry, which means um, on certain tight radii, vintage style radii, you, um, where's my power? You literally can't um, have a, an action that's below a certain height and still retain um, frets, uh, sorry, still retain bends that don't jump out. Uh, so on the 7.25 vintage radius, you have to settle for a slightly higher action. Now, all of that chatting, I've forgotten where I was. I'm going to do the uh, I'm going to do the D track now. So I think the D track is the last bit now, where I might eke out a little bit of congestion, and we'll we'll then clear up any constraints on the bends. But this is a I think it's a, a 9.25. I'm not I didn't look on the spec actually. It's either 9.25 or a or seven, but kind of might be a seven. Um, but anyway, it's we're going to see. I think we can get all the bends out of it. It's not an it's not an extremely low action. It's it's my normal target action, but it's neither, and it's not it's not pushing it too hard. But because of the um, you know it, it follows that because on bends the strings are going back downhill. Okay, it follows that anything you can do. To precisely remove uh, sticking up frets that are also stealing your clearance, anything you can do to remove those or flatten those out, then the more likely you know the, the extra bit of low action you can get for that otherwise tight radius. That's right, right on the last couple of frets now. That's the only choke out I can get out of this whole thing. Hardly. And that's almost in the G. So I'm going to go back to G, I'll recalibrate for G, and I'm just going to concentrate on those last few frets only, just to see if we can get that bend. I, I'm struggling to bend that far. My fingers aren't very strong. But we'll just recalibrate for the G track. And I do it to the north, I call it, uh, the far side of the track as I'm looking at it. And it's, it's already calibrated, so I don't need to adjust it. But I just, whenever I move around, I, I check to make sure. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to literally just, where I heard the choke out, I'm going to focus my attention. And by that, I mean I'm actually going to just slightly press down on those last few frets, because what I want is I just want to take away any obstructions to those bends. Now, some people might be thinking at this point, oh, is that the same as... What they call fall away on, you know, on less poles and stuff. Well, you, you could call anything that frees up, uh, frees up a bend that might be choking. Anything that gets uh, removes an obstructing fret near the end of the fingerboard could be called a fall away. But this is just, this is just focusing a bit of extra leveling energy on it. Um, sticking a bit sort of working at this end of the rod you can see I'm still pressing down over here so it's all working at the same time but I'm just kind of doing a bit of extra work at the end here and then what I'm hoping to do is I just want to make sure that that, that little E is as low an action as possible um, but we don't have to sacrifice the ability to bend right up into that track it's as good as it's going to get ah, and uh, you can see it's made my fingers go black so we're going to move on to the a track again recalibrate every time I move. Um, oh, whoa, I've lost track. Where am I on this board? It's, it's uh, yeah. 
it's the kind of force of habit really of sort of knowing where these brass dome knobs sit or where they live so we're on to the A and just moving the strings a little bit out of the way um, if, if you know if you know recognize or have seen a similar tool commercial tool to this which I learned this method from by buying it and using it and actually being converted to this method um, then you, you probably see that the sort of only downside if anything of this particular tool is that we have to do this moving the strings out of the way business now I think given that that costs nothing to make and does a brilliant job lovely um, given that it costs nothing to make does a great job I think you probably agree with me and, and given that it's not actually that hard to move the string put a little rubber block in to spread the space I, I think you'll agree with me that it's a very small price to pay and it's certainly no inconvenience to do that to have a free tool that does such a great job um, as you can see little spacer just keeps the strings out of my way while I'm doing this and then I'm just going to finish off on the E track now and you know I've, I've cut up a little bit on all of the frets and it's no problem at all you know even though the frets were a good set of frets on this um, basically I have got rid of the tiny bit of buzzing on the low strings and I got rid of the uh, choke out on the high E especially for such a low action that's great happy with that so there, there's my fret leveling done so I'm going to collect up the fret leveling bits and pieces get them out of the way just serve another day hang up my um, leveling rods beams which stick nicely to my magnetic shelf um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off all these strings I may keep them for a future um, use as sacrificial strings. Uh, actually no I won't because it's short scale so I won't have anything that matches it. So these are going to go in the bin. Now this is for you James, <laughs> this is all for you, um, but when you come to change the strings in future take them off one at a time from the one side to the other so that you leave the ones in the middle on last. Um, that way it won't flip the nut out of the slot and over the other side of the room because it can do that. And the same, put the strings on that way, start with the middle and work outwards just to keep it in place. It's just a sort of habit that I've got used to. And don't, you know, once you take the strings off, um, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to take the nut out and put it back in again when you're ready to restring. <laughs> so I'll just cut these off for for speed of operation, but also because I'm not keeping them for any purpose. Um, the only thing about this, I want to stick these things because they keep, a lot of the magnets come off when I lift up the tool and it's a bit fiddly. So I might actually put a dab of resin or something. But the problem is, um, the because it's metal, the paint I painted over it is a bit sort of doesn't stick very well. Um, so it's, it's hardly going to stick a blob of resin. So I think I'm stuck with having to take the tool off and then replace the magnet okay so um so here come the strings dead strings out the back and we're ready to clean up um clean up the fingerboard and then we'll be ready to do some fret filing followed by recrowning um and the whole job of polishing out through a whole range of grades of sanding um so i'm looking down here and i can see a tiny mark where the frets uh, where the grub screws is touching the um, wood they're not even compressing it which is great um, if it compresses at all and I haven't noticed any significant compression over a, you know, a couple of years that I've had them running these kind of nuts uh, if it does you can just all you're doing is just dialing a little bit more height into it um, while I'm at it I'm gonna just take so get a screwdriver and just take off the little the, the knobs here um, so that we can remove that horrible uh, horrible plastic cellophane stuff because it's annoying me. Now I can't 
for the life of me, find the one I was looking for, but this will do. It's quite tight, so there we go. So get your knobs off, get your knobs off. Um, if you want to be really fin finicky, you can take the whole of the pot, undo it from inside, but that's a, a bit of a big deal. The other way to do it is to cut round, very carefully cut round the washer, and you get most of what's there off. Now, these are good because they're they're um, solid shaft, which I like. I should remember to buy those more of those. They're much better design than those knurled, uh, sorry, split things. <coughs> Excuse me, which always break if you adjust them at all. Ah, there you go. Look at that horrible. So I'm just going round the outside of the washer. Again, not a problem to do that because this will never be seen by the naked eye underneath the knob, but it stops that horrible rustling business that goes on as you sweep your pots around. Now these should, I think they should be able to sit right down low. Let me just see if they can. No, it's not a switch or a button. The only thing to do when you're putting the knobs back on is get all your pots set to one place and then just decide where your screw um, section, the, piece, the place where the screw is going to be. So just so the two of them go to the same place and it looks, it looks orderly, or um, either orderly or OCDE, whichever way you choose to look at it. This, I don't, this, this one. So sometimes what happens is you put the knob on and it sits at a tilt, um, which I don't like. This one, for some reason, this tone one is, isn't is sitting flush the way the other one is. And if I tighten it up, it seems to want to kind of pulls it into a slightly uneven position. So that's okay, but it's sitting higher up than this one, so I need to go back and lift this one just slightly to match. So they kind of look the same. There we go. Right, so those are those. Everything else is clean. Okay, so things to do next. Um, getting rid of the dust. Things to do are, we're going to do the fret ends before I forget it. Um, and so there are a couple of tools we can use. It's, uh, looking very closely at these, they've already been rounded off, but I'm going to do it again just in case. So we get the fret, fret tool and we kind of just go down it and it rounds off the edge of the beveled sorry man, not very good view it rounds off the edge of the beveled fret um, and you can also while you're doing it you can also mostly take off the any little tangs or little shards sticky out bits in the corner um, now the, the reason for doing this now is that in the next couple of steps I'm going to um, I'm going to sand out all the frets and we can then tidy up any sharp bits that are on the end at the same time make sure we, we roll the um, sandpaper over onto the fret ends and that way you can usually get a, a nice so a much softer touch so you can pretty much do all of this with this one tool. Sometimes I use this little finer, smaller one. Um, it's got a safe edge to it, so you can run it down the wood. Both these have all got safe edges, so that this this can kind of run down the wood, work on the fret, but without scraping or putting a telltale zigzag. There's a there's a kind of herringbone effect you can get if you if the edge of your fret, uh, your edge of your file is sharp. And often you can see it as a telltale piece of history, um, re uh, or kind of residue of somebody else's fret work. But like I said before, one of the simplest ways, once you've rounded the face of the fret off a little bit like this, and we'll do the other side as well in a minute, um, what we can then do is we can um, run down the edge with some sandpaper and just we can start making these fret edges um, smoother 
and there's nothing like it when they're finally all uh, kind of polished out or smoothed out. It's, it's a much nicer feel. Um, it's, it's, it can be, you know, it can take quite a bit to do because um, the, the frets are. It doesn't take much to to end up putting a sharp edge back on them without realizing it. Um, boring so this is a number of ways you can work your fret ends um, I mean one of the ways if I'm at home and I'm bored and I just want to do something really slowly sometimes I'll sit there with a file like this and press this against the ground and just you know run it run it over the edge like that that's okay but um, it, it's uh, it puts a scratch on it you know and then you've got to sand that scratch out so you, you, you're kind of making a bit of extra work what I like to do is I like to get a little bit of a little tube of sandpaper um, and this this is where you you can't do this without touching the finish and it's because it's literally you have to think about this practically if you're going to change the edges of these frets it's impossible to do it without touching the wood on the edge you, there's no way you can just treat each fret on its own so what you have to do or you can do is you get a little roll of um, sandpaper like this and we're going to just run it up and down along the mostly along the end of the fret now it, it will be just skipping over the, the edge of the fingerboard right and you will raise a little bit of dust but if you're careful and you watch where you're going you're just mostly working on the fret end and because it's a round tube the other nice thing that will happen is it will sort of roll inside um, on those edges where you just put the file so this little running down with the leaning leaned over sandpaper um, gives you a softening off of the frets um, which is, is a nice touch and if you want to go even further you can you can flatten this um, with two different things if you do it in a ro rolled up thing I'll do the other side the same it, this is this is and you're sort of about what 30 degrees this is rolling up and over the fret the edge of the bevel and it's helping to round off and smooth off that bit that we already just smoothed off be very careful down here if you're not confident take that off um, I'm fairly confident doing it so I'm just letting this tube roll over those fret ends um, and then I'll switch to the other side and we'll do the same again um, and then what we can do afterwards I'm changing and just re-roll it the other way but then afterwards you can flatten it down and you can then run down and just get the faces of the the beveled frets and that will give them uh, a really nice finish too or you know start shining that up and again you can pick that up pick the uh, help soften that up when you come to sand through the different grades to polish out the frets which we'll do in a minute and, uh, so you can hear this sort of clipping the edges of the, the frets where they were sharp okay now in this case I will put a bit of tape on because if I'm going to run this down the edge now I'm going to want this out just just protect this here so I don't run any risks of running into it and double double thickness of tape is better than getting a scratch give myself a protect the protective barrier there so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to slightly flatten this down crush it like a flatten the tube. Now I'm going to hold it and I'm going to direct it down those fret ends with my fingertip. Now this is going to polish up the very ends of the beveled sloping faces. And you can see of course it's 
it's it's catching a little bit of the um, fingerboard edge. And I say you, you you can't get away from that. But as soon as you take that away, you start to see that you're getting um, a nice softened finish. Now have a pair of scissors handy because once you've scuffed up a bit of your tube, you can either fold it around the other way, or you can inside out it, or you can um, you can just chop it off with the scissors. And so now what I'm doing, and I'm just watching, and I want to get the very edges now of the frets because I, I want to take away any file marks and I want those things to shine at me. And if I can get these nicely uh, edged off now, they'll, and I'll do the same with 600 in a minute, what we'll get out of this is a beautiful finish. All right, there you go. And they're nicely flat that side. And then we'll go over and we'll do the same on the other side. Like I say, it can look a bit scary if, if you've not done it before because it has to, it has to just, you can't avoid touching the edge of the fingerboard. Luckily, most people kind of like less than razor sharp fingerboard edge anyway. So this only helps that process. It sort of rolls it just a little bit. But the main reason for doing this is to, is to get those slanted beveled edges um, cleaned up so that they can start to shine and they're softer to the fingers. Okay, so that's my 240 grit version. So we still have lots to do on the frets, but that's not, that's now looking. The ends of that are looking. The ends of those are looking great. So before I go to the rest of the work here, I'm going to do another bit with. Um, Another bit with 600 grit tube. Again, starting off with it round, and I'm going to let it bounce down up and over at the end bits, in and out of each fret. And the tube sort of lets it round off both sides of the fret end. All right, I'll do that down the other side. Same thing. Again, this is at a very steep angle, so it's only doing the tops and edges of the frets, not really hitting the fingerboard edge, uh, hardly at all. But we will in a minute, I'll flatten it again. So that's, that's doing my best to soften the edge. Okay, so now we'll flatten this down and we'll go and we'll shine up those edges again like we did before this time with quite a, a lot finer paper which will really help to put that shine on them. We'll start on this side since we're there. And again this is now I'm, I'm gonna let my finger find the edge of the frets and I just want this to put a nice shine on them. Now what this is doing is it's taking um, you know it's, it's clipping the edge of the fingerboard um, but not much. You can then, what's the word, polish that out like that. So now we've got really nice, beginning to get shiny, um, really nice smooth fret ends. And then we'll do the same on this end, but I'll, I'll just go on this side. So anything from 600 onwards now will be just shining these fret ends up. With a bit of luck, by the time the frets themselves now are all beautifully shined out, so will these fret ends be. And then you won't see any scratch marks on them from files. Yeah, it's looking good. Nice. Right, that's as much as I need to do. Throw these bits away. Um, so next stop, we might as well leave that there for now. Next stop will be to repaint the frets um, because we need to reshape them. So if we put a, a slight flat spot on them by leveling them, now what I want to do is just um, recrown them to make sure that the frets are returned to a nice arch shaped. I, keep, I, I can't find another word for it, uh, a, a U-shaped uh, um, arch. Hmm. All right, so the great thing about this tool, it's a, it's a Stumac, expensive Stumac tool. But I've been using it for years and it's given great service. Um, 
I also want to uh, I have a wire brush so I can just unclog the thing as I use it. It's getting old now um, and it can clog up if I'm not careful. So I'm going to use the jumbo side and the idea is I'll just take off, I'll run it, take off the <coughs> um, black marker pen and it, it, what it does, because it's a concave diamond diamond coated file, it'll take off the shoulder of the flat spot if you like um, and it will bring that in until your fret is reshaped into a, 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 an arch shape again. And the way you know you've got the arch shape but you haven't adjusted the height any further because we've made them all level so we don't want to do that is by adding this marker pen so you, you kind of work the tool until you, you end up with the thinnest possible black line of marker um, but you want to make sure that you leave that marker pen there because that tells you you haven't adjusted the, or impacted negatively the height of the fret which is exactly what, or the height of the fret top which is what we want we want to reshape it but keep it the same height so you can see that I'm whizzing down here because these frets have hardly had any material taken from them. There might be a couple at the end that we'll stop a little bit longer on. Um, but this is always a very good indicator if you're ever nervous about how much um, material you've taken. It's it, when you practice doing this, th this part of the process each time will confirm or challenge what you think because you, you may think you've taken loads of material. Uh, if you have, this part will take a fair while to do. Um, you can see there's almost nothing coming. Um, I'm spending almost no time here because there's virtually no flattening of the frets. Um, but we still, it still was enough to get to where we wanted with uh, even um, you know, getting an overall levelness. So I'm quite happy with that. And actually, there's so little to do um, it, this just goes to show that the amount taken there's a bit in the middle of here now because I knew there was a little bit in the center of that fret that took a bit of leveling and that's where the um, that's where the choke out, <coughs> excuse me the choke out was coming and there'll be a little bit more now on this end fret too so for the first time I'm stopping and doing a bit of extra hard work on there just to bring the flattened the uh, sharp edges back in or getting rid of them until we got a nice D shape. Okay, so there we are. Frets leveled, ends um, softened up, and we're going to carry on doing that with the grades of sandpaper that we use. Um, it gets a little dusty when this goes on, but we can always wipe that off very easily. Um, my hands get dirty, so I always make sure that I wash them before I get anywhere near the new strings. Okay, so the next part of this process is to mask off the fingerboard ready for uh, polishing out the frets and somewhere I've got new tape, low tack masking tape, it's here. Um, I need to go to the market and get some more if it's if they're running. But, um, so this, this will, will now put on a load of tape to protect the fingerboard and then we'll get into the process of the, the final polish out using a range of grits um, I'll go off camera for that because it's a bit boring for me so I can put the radio on and at least have a bit of entertainment it's about half an hour of sanding different through all the grades in fact I did three different fret levelings yesterday and I was so sick of doing it by the end of it, it, it you know I've done it 2,000 times or something since I've been doing this it's uh, you know you can you can eventually have too much of a good thing. Um, so this, this is an interesting one when you're putting on masking tape um, or when you're protecting the fingerboard prior to polishing out all your frets you have to make a judgment call on this. Um, modern finishes uh, whether they're polyurethane or whether they're nitrocellulose, modern finishes um, can uh, can, that's a word. Yeah, can withstand um, masking tape acting as a protective thingy, yeah, protection layer, um, without damaging the finish. Unfortunately, on some older finishes, 
and not not some not that much older, um, particularly some fender finishes, uh, that even low tack masking tape can cause an already dodgy finish to come off. And I've had that happen to me once, possibly twice on, I think they were a 1990s or 2000, the noughties um, fenders. And it, your, your, your option, your only real viable option, if you, if you don't want to get, ever get caught out like that, is not to use any kind of tape at all. In which case, you kind of have to resign yourself to um, polishing a limited amount of polishing because you can't really get it as effective as this. Uh, and you have to use a fret protector strips, which are little metal strips that you have to kind of move along and hold in place over each fret as you go to protect the surrounding fretboard. And, and actually, I find that personally, I find that really hard to use. Certainly, too hard to use to get any, you know, really good uniform um, polishing out of it but you know it, it all depends if, if somebody brought me now brought me a you know 2000s um, USA fender I might be my, my little alarm bells might be kind of going and I might think twice about using this method um, it, and it isn't there wasn't really anything you could see about it it just comes down to how well or badly the the thin finish that um, Fender put on the guitar, how well or badly it uh, adhered to it. And you can't really know until you put the tape on, you protect it, you do all your polishing out and your sanding, and then you come to remove the tape as carefully as you can, as low tack tape as you can possibly find. And lo and behold, the uh, ultra thin poly, usually I think it was, uh, just flakes off in great rafts of loose, thin, flaky finish and it's like I say there's nothing you can really do about it at that point other than refinish the neck um, which is something I've done once or possibly twice um, you know because it's not the customer's fault I, you know I didn't charge the customer for doing it it's just one of those things but practically speaking I don't think it's feasible to use the fret, fret protector on every polish out that you do um, because it just you just don't get as consistent and as thorough a polish, um, and uh, you know you'd be there forever trying to use the protector strip, but it's very very hard to actually hold it in place and use it uh, as you're doing things. So I don't know, it's a difficult one. I think I think all you can do is use your if you have build up the experience, and I don't necessarily think I have that much experience yet but if you the best you can do is build up the experience to be able to sniff out the dodgy looking finish when it comes along and avoid it and in that case if you sort of suspect it um, go go and do the tell the customer look I think yours is of the era where the finish is very very fragile so I'm afraid I'm not going to do the same kind of polish that I would normally do because I don't want to risk the, uh, the finish flaking off um, and that's about all you can do and, and it depends really on you having a sort of sense of what you're looking at um, sometimes you can tell if it's one of those guitars from that era and it's already starting to flake that's a very strong giveaway and and so you'd be you know you'd be well um, it'd be just as well if you could recognize that and and avoid making it worse um, you know, because people kind of, they're happy with their, you know, their finish flakes and wears naturally, organically over time. You know, it's a kind of relicking people who enjoy that. But, um, you know, and they're, nobody's happier than a maple neck owner when the maples kind of look worn through and the whole thing looks like it's, you know, come out of the 1950s American Badlands. But somehow they don't seem to like it if it wasn't there when, you, when they sent it to you. And lo and behold, it suddenly turned into a, you know, vintage 1950s no cast or something. Anyway, so it's a it's a tricky one. But you know, I'm making a judgment. This is very stable, modern-looking um, finish. But it is Fender, and it is North America. Well, sort of nearly Mexico, but 
you know, it's it's North America. It's North America um, Fender, and so you know, I may be wrong. This may just turn out to be a lovely new, pretty new um, guitar that it all falls off. And I'm doing my best to get a nice polish on the uh, frets and repay me with that. But you just don't know. So I'm um, uh, ardent boring fans of real life guitars might notice that I'm kind of um, I'm economizing on paper not that it costs anything really to use this paper but I just got I got tired of cutting extra strips and I suddenly realized that I was kind of throwing quite a lot of this paper away without it doing anything worthwhile so I tried to get sort of use each piece three times sort of um, not reuse it, but you know what I mean, like this. Tear a bit off, and in fact, I could cut them shorter, but it just, just forces them out. I keep on doing it this way, um, and I end up with a bit left over instead, which I peel off and throw away, like you saw just now. So it don't work out either way. But there you go. So this this goes on for twenty minutes of fiddling and faffing around, and uh, I'll put some tape over here to protect things, and then we'll. Off camera, I'll do the sanding and I will return when it's time to put on new strings or put some oil on the board and put new strings on. Um, and so, you know, on, on the one hand, you've seen a guitar that had a pretty good set of frets on it. I was, you know, impressed. Um, and, you know, it's a kind of guitar that you could play this out of the box and most people would absolutely not have any complaints about this it's, it's a very playable instrument um, but my customer comes to me and says look I, I I want this to be as you know as low as you can or lower than it currently is you didn't say low as you can get it it was low as it currently is uh, lower than it currently is and and I don't like the sharp fret edges so you know you put the two things together and you say okay that's gonna that's gonna require some fret work um, and you know in playing it you find just a hint of choke and a hint of buzz and you think well okay I'm going to be I'm going to be sanding the edges anyway I'm going to need to sand the edges so and I've got a little bit of obstruction here and we want the action set a bit lower so let's get a precision level on it anyway and then we'll take care of all the polishing out in all in one go and we will have the best action. Now, the beautiful thing about that is, of course, if you want it higher, just like with the adjustable nut, um, you can raise things at either end and, and you can obviously go higher, but you know then that you can return it back to the 1.5 millimeters on the low E, last fret measurement, um, and you can also do the same, you know, either side, and you can go back to 1.2 millimeters on the high E last fret action. Um, there's a sort of tradition in, in guitar text, I suppose that most people measure the playing action that varies. In fact, it varies quite a bit. Some people will do it, you know, 12th fret or 17th fret or whatever. And, and I, I've never wanted to argue with anybody for more than 0, 0.0 seconds about which I choose or why, right? And I and I want to live in a world where I it should suffice for me to say to somebody, this is how it works for me to get a guitar to play the way I and most of my customers seem to like. So let's not get hung up about um, you know whether it's a measurement here or a measurement there because for me the measurements don't mean anything they're just a means to an end i don't i don't care how much relief it is like i said before uh, i care more that you you and i know what the relief does and how it changes and and so that we know how to adjust it to get what we want um i don't care whether i don't care what that measures physically um, i only say 0 0.2 ish as a start point and if, if I set 0 0.2 on this guitar and it doesn't feel to me right and I try it a bit lower and that actually makes me feel better about this guitar then I'll go lower so I don't have any measurements that I aim for each time um, other than as a, as, a, as a means to get to somewhere 
and to get to somewhere is, is quite simply just a, a guitar that feels good to play and stays and plays plays and stays in tune and that's the only goal you know seeing the outcome on after right i'm going to go off put radio on um get me sanding head on and get all of this done and then i'll come back to you shortly back for the final thingy final leg of the thing and here we have it it is time to add a bit of the old lemon oil and once that's on the new strings on and we'll stretch them out intonate and be putting this baby in their case back home um, ready to pack up and send on uh, back to James who is away for the time being and I uh, won't need to go until early next week so there's no rush but I wanted to get it done today um, righty so there we go strings 32s um, string throughs I've taken the neck plate off the back and I've pulled out or freed up the trapped cellophane that was there so we're, we're cellophane free oh look I'm putting the low E string at the top for a change I've done so many left-handed guitars recently it seems odd to be stringing it right-handed but hey so um, again James uh, as you've probably seen on my videos you may have seen on my videos just one thing I'm sorry about the camera angle here we're kind of close so I don't know how well it is working out maybe if we'd have a higher one but anyway um, I always make a big deal about staying and play, guitars playing and then staying in tune to me that's the ultimate aim that we're aiming for we want a guitar that that's good to play and that sounds good of course um, but but it we the, the interesting thing is we can have great pickups and we can even have a good action but if the thing doesn't stay in tune it's amazing that it just stays on the peg and it gets it gets passed over for in favor of a guitar that may be far lesser in terms of spec and you know quality of parts and so on but but which can be depended on to stay in tune um, and that you know amazingly that becomes the go-to guitar for, no, I can't get this damn e-string through oh I could do without that um, yeah so the, the issue of playing and staying in tune is so important and that's why I kind of make it my priority is always the first on the list is play is, is playing playing in tune and staying in tune that's the that's the main number one thing my attention is on then immediately after that is um, making the action light and easy to play, good to play. Then after that, it's uh, making it sound good. So that's down to what have we got on board? How can we, you know, what the best kind of pickups we can get for the budget we've got? And then after that comes what it looks like, funnily enough. Um, and then finally at the last on the on the list of whoop, I'm doing it the wrong way around I want to put the nut in and I want to put I want to put on the uh, first oh by the way I forgot the little thing now how about that little little aspect I forgot on this it actually it, it's actually pretty good it doesn't seem like it wants to go anywhere but um, it makes sense to mark where these um, where these little feet sit and and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little tiny marker in the in the rosewood on each footprint now it's already made that pressed and made a little sort of shine there and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to get a small uh, drill bit like this i'm not going to get i'll get a smaller one even um and i'm just going to by hand i'm going to twizzle a drill bit and i'm going to make a little tiny dent in the rosewood just by hand and you don't have to press hard at all it's quite capable of you know drilling a little hand drilled hole <laughs> so I'm just just literally making a, a very small <laughs> little small indentation in both places and then I'm going to move to a slightly bigger thing will it go all the way around yay 
So I made it just a very, very small impression that I can basically seat, seat these, the feet of these, this nut into. Now that means I have to just put it up a tiny bit more, but that now is stopping it from moving anywhere. So I discovered that's a simple enough way to do it. So what I'm going to do is, as I mentioned before, I'm going to go with the D first and get that one in and tightened up. So with my stringing, you want to limit as much as possible how much you put around there. You want enough to hold it, not enough, not so little that it undoes. So I tend to find a fret's worth, um, I pull back a fret's worth and I tighten and I hold the tight string, make sure it goes over the loose one on the first time. And then as it comes round, I yank up the loose one and make the held one go under the loose one. And then that sits nicely there and there's two there's two visible lines of string and the spare bit comes out the middle between those two lines and that is enough um, to hold it without having too much that stores up um, slack. Now this uh, this nut now is tiny fraction too low of course because it's now sitting in two little dents that I made for it. Um, so once we get the strings on and stretched up to tension then I'm going to want to just tweak the nut. But the beauty of the adjustable nut is you can you can have it set at any way you like from no height, which case it won't play, um, and you just turn it up until it plays the way you like. Uh, you might try setting it really low and you might find that um, it, it isn't quite high enough and it buzzes when, the, when you really hit the strings and you don't like the fact that it buzzes on the first fret, um, in which case you take it up a little bit more and you've got the option to keep, keep tweaking it until it's as low as you like it or as high as you like it. And that, that's a nice thing about having the, the built-in adjustability. I find. But also that thing that I said before about um, we're working with slots that haven't been cut into by human hands because no matter, I've found that no matter how good your your files are, um, they always have a degree of flex in them uh, or they don't cut the, you know, they, they make the slot a little bit more ragged than you would like. So why wouldn't you want to use the factory made slots um, as untouched as the day they were put in into the uh, nut by the manufacturer. Use the best of what they do, I think. Um, so that, that's my that's my kind of rationale. And what isn't negotiable in all of this, if, if you're going to, um, I didn't really go on about it in this video, but one of the reasons when I started doing this that I got so interested in the uh, height of the first fret action was I discovered um, that it was, it was what actually got me into tweaking guitars at all. Um, and I discovered that a difference as much as, or as little as half a millimetre, or it, let's put it this way, anything over half a millimetre first fret action um, makes the string go sharp when you play it because it's too high. Um, and I, I found that really interesting um, because I, it, I, having discovered that, it fixed the problem I had with that guitar immediately. Um, and I started to sort of look and see what the minimum amount was versus the optimum versus what, what's too much. And I started to notice that guitars coming out of um, factories everywhere, including Gibson, were coming out with huge first fret actions and all the notes were playing out of tune from the first fret, um, you know, especially near the nut. And it just made them awful to play. Um, and so I kind of uh, started setting or making it very important to set the strings set the first fret action very low and I I kind of found a good a good working compromise or a median sort of height of 0.3 of a millimeter which seemed to really work well very light and easy to play with no teach um, no nothing going sharp and nothing playing out of tune um, and then of course I realized that I was having to cut down, always cut. To get that kind of ac action, you really couldn't, you couldn't sand a nut from the base and hope to get it. I mean, you could occasionally get it exactly right. Um, but you'd usually overcut it or not go far enough. And, um, And so uh, 
you know, you had to always cut downwards. And so I, obviously I spent a lot of time cutting downwards, um, which I didn't mind because it became so important to get that precise first spread action. Um, but it was a lot of time spent cutting down. And of course, it always meant that, um, you, you know, your, the slots were always cut into, you know, you, you could never, you could never uh, have a, use this sort of nice smooth factory cut slots until I discovered this method um, or found this method or worked, figured it out or whatever you want to call it and then suddenly this became God, this is so light beautiful oh, that is so light that uh, good I wouldn't like to guess what that action is but it's tiny but there you are it plays beautifully just like that light as a feather um so Okay, so anyway, so I, so when I discovered the, the optimum ways to bring some factory-made nut slots up to the correct action, so push the strings to the correct action instead of cutting downwards, that I started using adjustable nuts, and I and I use them on these straps, and I use them on um, uh, what do we call it, Les Pauls as well. What I'm going to do here, by the way, as I'm here, I'm just going to round off. This is quite a sharp. Um, Quite a sharp edge to this nut, so I'm just going to um, gently try and round this off a little bit so it doesn't feel quite so. I mean, all nice soft fret edges, it's a shame to kind of get hurt by the, um, by the edge of the tusk nut. So there's my safe edges on here, so I can, can use this a little bit. Um, yeah, so, so I became a convert to the whole thing of what, what I do now, which is to um, bring the slots up and get get the first spread action I want by bringing the, bringing the strings up instead of downwards. So uh, that's what I do on both uh, Les Pauls strats, both on Les Paul strats and um, well, three aside type guitars and Fender style guitars. Um, and, and I, I can't, haven't looked back from it, to be honest. That's what I do all the time. I used to then, you know, I'd say to people, you know, would you like this thing that I do? And uh, and then I'd add it as a sort of, you know, priced extra. And actually, now when somebody asks me how much my setup is, I quote it with an adjustable tusk nut in there. Um, because I just can't see why I wouldn't. It's the best, it's the best playing solution that you can get. Um, and it just it seems to me that's what I'm in the business to try and do is the best possible not start halfway and then kind of add on extras I just think you know my ideal setup is just what I've done here tusk nut at one end you know adjustable bridge at the other or saddles at the other end ideally a tusk um, string tree that's what I would recommend highly So the tuning stability has got everything to do with well, it's made up of two things, right? Not your tuners, first of all. The tuners have got almost nothing to do with stability of tuning. Um, they have everything to do with smoothness and precision, but they don't have anything to do with the guitar going out of tune. When the guitar goes out of tune, it's because um, you're either one of two or both of two things, uh, and they are the two components of tuning stability. One is it'll go out of tune because the nut slots are catching the strings. They're either bent, twisted, shaggy, too tight, whatever. They're not, the strings aren't flowing friction free. That's half of it. And the other half is unreleased slackened strings. Hear it pinging through that tusk, uh, that metal string tree, and I, I don't like that. It's a shame. So I, I highly recommend you change it. Um, so anyway, so what I'm doing is I, I've done half of the, one half of it, the nut part I've taken care of by putting a tusk nut in, which has got PTFE in it, which is naturally the smoothest or the, the least friction material you can get, um, and we've got we've got untouched. 
fret uh, nut slots so they're as smooth as they can be for all manner of reasons and they are up at the right height so we don't have any of that high first fret action and distortion um, when you press down at that end. So everything about the nut is taken care of so that's half of your tuning stability taken care of. And what I'm doing now I'm now ringing out the last of the slack so that when you get this guitar you'll probably need just to tweak it into tune uh, out of the box or out of the packing but I'm convinced you'll be able to then play it for hours and it will be in tune because I've done this. And I recommend that every time you change your strings, you go through it as much as I did there. this neck relief. Yeah, it's nice and flat. Okay, the thing we do now is we check the intonation using the tuner and guitar lead. Thankfully this is mounted, we've got the jack plug mounted on the front, so that means I can lift it up and do the adjustments without bending the jack socket, jack lead, which I hate to do. Get our guitar lead. All right, noise. Sharp. All sharp, they're all too close, it means they've all got to come backwards away from the uh, away from the nut end. So that's interesting. Okay, so the intonation, the intonation thing is an approximation anyway, because we all it, there's a there's a single variable in this that, that's different from everybody who does it. So People will get very precise, and uh, you know they'll, they'll insist that there's only, you know, that you have to have expensive equipment, this and the other, to, to test the intonation. Intonation, it, it, that would be great if there wasn't for the fact that the one key variable in this is so vastly gross. In other words, it can, it's so variable in its variableness that there's no point having expensive tuning machinery, right? So, how hard I press the strings. Is, is the key gross variable. And so it changes from every person to every person. It changes every night and day I do it. So there's no point getting all hung up about um, multi-million pound tuners when you're going to actually individually, you're going to ch press it at a different, um, a different pressure each time. When none of us, no two people are ever going to do it the same. Um, so it's only at best an approximation. And we do it by 
pressing, uh, pinging the harmonic on the, or tuning the harmonic ping to an E, and then fretting the 12th fret with a sort of best guess normal finger pressure. That's going to be different for me than it is to you. If you're a, you know, let's say you're a, you know, you're a farmer and you do manual work all the time, your hand strength is going to be much stronger than mine, and you may well press the frets much harder. And so what I set this intonation to may be out of intonation to you because every, the one variable in your equation, the, the strength with which you fret the note, may be significantly different from mine. So there isn't an absolute, that's what I'm trying to get across, right? And anyone who tells you there, there is, is talking crap. So at my standard, my normal fretting, you can see that the 12th fret of all of these notes is sharp. And that means that the string is too short, it's playing length, right? So I'm going to um, pull it back to make it to a, to a length that's going to work. And I'm, what I'm going to try and do, is I'm going to use a different screwdriver, I'm going to try and get the, um, the correct length for the top E string, first of all, and then I'll position the others based off, off of that. I hate saying that, that's incorrect, but you know what I mean. So it was quite a bit too sharp, so I'm going to drag the string back, the saddle back, I'm sorry. So I'm lengthening the string, the playing length of the string. Now that will have gone sharp because I've, I've pulled the saddle back against the string. Hear that creaking? That's the, that's the string tree, I hate it. Not good. That's now flat, so I went a little bit too far. Sometimes these things are more, can be a lot more sensitive than others. Some, some guitars can be much more sensitive than others. Right now, based on what I know, I'm now going to um, stagger the rest of these strings approximately where I expect them to fall if all things are equal which they never are, but I'm going to, I'm, what I'm doing now, as you can see, I'm, well, you may see, I'm following a, a time-worn pattern of, uh, that you, we come to expect when we're using three plane and three wound strings. Um, and it's, just, it's to stagger back in this direction away from the nut, um, and it's two groups of three. The first three on the plane ones go back one after the another, and then the first one of the wound ones jumps forward of the last one, of the plain ones and it goes back then from there in a little group of three on wound ones. Oh, that string tree is bugging me. Do you know what? I can't, I can't send you, I can't send this guitar out with that crap on there. It's just, it makes a mockery of everything I've done. I'm going to st steal one of these. This is from somebody else's stuff. Um, I'm, I'll bill, I, I'm going to take an executive decision and bill you for, for these, right? Um, I'm not going to, I'll bill you for one of them, okay? They, they come in pairs, but you only need one on here. And I'm going to use one, and they're, uh, they're like 12, 14 quid a pair, so I'll bill you seven quid for, or six, seven quid in postage for one. And we are going to now take an executive decision to get rid of this horrible metal string tree. It's, a spo it's the one thing spoiling this guitar now, and that's just wrong that we should do that for the sake. I hate the fact that Mexico does that. It's like the Mexicans, oh, you can keep this, or I'll give it you with your original nut, but it's like the Mexicans do that with the um, zinc alloy bridges, the worst quality. They put them on the Mexican, made in Mexico strats. Okay. I'm, 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 you sent this guitar to me because you want quality, and I'm giving you quality. I'm not going to mess you around with a crappy metal string tree that pings every time you tune, because that will be arresting the tuning as well. better. I feel happy now. Right, let's go back to where we were. E, hey, hi E. Uh, oh, I've been moving things around, haven't I? Right. Let's just retune.
Okay, didn't break that. Right, give them a last tug, gently. Now settle down. Ah, oh, no pings. Fraction short still. A tiny little bit. Okay. Short, short, pull it back, pull it back. Now pull these back to match. So the intonation is a really important part of the deal. And it's let's get these first three right. Bang on. Always the way. Check the action on here. We are, we are very low. Let's just double check this. Yeah, having flattened out a little bit, we're just on the edge, fractionally too low. This one a little tiny bit. Right, we'll come back a bit on that E, still too far forward. That looks about right. So ultimately in a set of six strings in a right-handed guitar, your um, E, your low E is going to need the longest string length of all, um, and your high E, the shortest, relatively speaking. So I have a feeling that this group needs to come back a whole set together, and then all of these come back. You can see this will be right on the money now. Three, two, one, right now.
hard to get my fingers in those little frets. There you go, folks, worth sticking with. That's quite a range out of position from where I got it, okay? But that is correctly intonated for a standard fingering pressure, which is as good as I can tell you, um, is, is the best, you know, it's closest to what I can get to average, right? But I, you know, it is, like I said, it's, it's subjective, it's, it's particular to me. Um, you might have a different grip, in which case you might want to make adjustments, but that's how you do it. And it is that important. Trust the pattern of the two sets of threes. Whenever you have three plain and three wound strings and a standard string set, I don't mean flat wounds or weird, jazzy, exotic, strange things or four ones with a wound G or whatever. Uh, with three and three, you get that pattern there for a right-handed guitar. If you don't get that pattern, if one of the strings is wildly out, it might be either you've got a wound G, in which case the wound G actually lives, it, it's part of this group and it comes forward of this one. So the wound G is at the front here. So you go plain E, plain B, and the B steps back from the E, and then the wound G steps forward of the plain B and then you go backwards all the way with the wound ones. That's that's why your your, your um, G might be out of position. But if you let's say you you go to intonate as I did there, and you get let's say the E uh, the A is way out of you know it wants to be out here somewhere. Throw the E string uh, throw the A string throw the offending string away, um, and buy another one. Get another one. It's almost always a fault in the string, and just replacing it will cure the problem. Now look, I'm really happy with this. This is a for me. I think this is a this is a, a blinding guitar to play. Now it's incredibly low action. Um, I will tape on the little hex key that comes with this. Actually, I've got a little. I'm going to put these three things in a little bag. Um, I will tape the little bag with these three things together. Now that's my drill bag. Come on, where's the plastic bag? You throw the kind of in the way. Um, Out I've got some kicking around here, but I don't know where they're wrong. Little ones, small ones, big ones. Stuff, stuff in it, ones. Ah, oh, blimey. It's always the way. Bits floating around. Ah, here's one. Right, job done. So here's your little bits, your little hex key, tiny little hex key for adjusting the nut. Um, and the original string tree, um, I don't. You know, when you heard it, if you watch the video about it, you'll hear that thing pinging when I was tuning the E and the B, and that's just not right. And it's not, it's a shame to spoil a good guitar like this with a piece of crap metal like that. Shame on you, Fender, you shouldn't have done that. Okay, we're done. James, thank you for sending it to me. Um, it's been my pleasure uh, setting it up, and um, yeah, uh, look forward to hearing from you when you get it back. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you again soon.